Everyone, we're going to have a quick opening prayer, and then we're going to go right into worship. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this night that we have to worship you, that we have to give what we have to offer our lives to you, Lord. Thank you for everyone that's able to make it here tonight. And we pray for those that are not here tonight, Lord, that they would be edified. And um, just bless this night. Bless the message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, everyone, let's turn over to 246. can have a seat and uh, we did a little bit of different we're going to pray here in a minute as we start the message brother Robert would you hand these out I think there's enough there's 15 copies so um, so we're going to cover a subject tonight I think is um, how to have 
God-given contentment. Uh, contentment. And so I've taken some time, put a lot of definitions in here. So again, this is going to be probably more of a teaching um, class tonight, more than anything else. Um, but we want to have the idea of contentment is a is is really falls from the idea of of that we are commanded by God not to covet. So, okay, so the. The antonym for, for covetousness would be contentment. Antonym meaning the opposite. All right, so if we're, if we're wanting to, and it's a big deal, and God gave it as, as you might remember it, as the Tenth Commandment. Thou shalt not, what? Covet. And so we're still, by the grace of God, can get victory over the idea of covetousness. I, I think I've talked to some folks that feel like that, that sometimes covetousness is ruling and reigning in their life, and, and I know what that means. Um, we have and live in a country where people are in debt <laughs> way over their head, and or they're spending every dime and living from check to check and thinking that that's the way life is. And really, a lot of it is, has to do with the idea of being content. So we're going to look at the, some verses today. We're going to actually start off in, in Philipp, Philippians chapter number 4. So if you take your Bibles and turn there, we're going to read. Uh, actually, it says verse 11, but we're actually going to start in verse number 10 of Philippians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Philippians chapter number 4, starting in verse number 10. The Bible says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care of me hath flourished again. Wherein ye were also careful, but lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be what? Content. I've learned whatsoever state I'm in to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now that sounds kind of contradictory. How can you be both at the same time? Well, you can be. Paul said, I've learned that. In verse number 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Now think of the context there. We, we always pull that verse out, Four, Philippians 4, 30. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And what he's saying there is we're talking about what? Contentment. He says we can be content, but we can't be content without who? Christ. Christ is the one that makes us content. He's the one that gives us our peace. He's the one that gives us our rest. So we follow on down in verse 14. Notwithstanding, ye have done well that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once again unto my necessities, not because, and listen to this, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that ye may abound, that, that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet-smelling savor, a sacrifice acceptable and well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's ask the Lord for help tonight. Father, we thank you that, Lord, if, if we can't be content, Father, there's something wrong. There's something spiritually wrong. There's something, Father, that we're not seeing about what a, the Christian life is. 
And so I pray that you'd give us the grace to not only to, to see the truth, but, Father, to be able to apply it. Now, Lord, we want to be a, a good representative of you in this world. And, Lord, we know to be that representative, Father, there has to be a sense of well-being. That, Father, you are our Lord, you are our Savior, you are in control. And that, Father, that, that nothing can happen without your permission. And so, Father, give us grace to see that and make that application. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to look at some definitions to kind of be to start with. But I want to, before we start, I want us to see in, uh, in other couple of scriptures, and I put them in parentheses there in your, in your notes, 1 Timothy chapter number uh, 6. It actually starts in verse 2 and goes through verse 11. But the idea being there is that Paul is admonishing Timothy in this same idea. He has learned to be content and no matter what state he is in. And he's admonishing his son in the faith in the same way. If you look with me in chapter 6, starting in verse number 2, 1 Timothy chapter number 6, starting in verse 2, it says, And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service. Because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit, these things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words where cometh envying, strife, evil surmising, perverse disputing of men of corrupt mind, destitute of the truth, Supposing that what? Gain is godliness from such withdraw yourself. So he's basically saying this is, it can creep into the church. It can creep in by this idea that somehow the more you get, the more blessed you are, that somehow that's, that's the idea of God is, is doing that. But the godliness, notice what it says in verse 6, but godliness with what? Contentment is what? Great gain. When we can learn to be content and we understand that, and, he's, and as he begins this thing, and you know, they had the people that were uh, the, their bosses, and then they had the servants under them, and so there was this kind of unequal status in the church, and, and, but they had to learn that, hey, this is just because he has the, uh, he has the money and you, you don't, you're in the servant court, that doesn't mean that you can't be content. He says, for we brought nothing into this world, and certainly, what? We're not going to take anything out. He says, and, and having food and raiment, let us therewith be what? Content. <laughs> I don't know about you. Just food and clothes, I don't think would satisfy us. we got to have all the trimmings, right? But this is the teaching from God's Word, with food and what? Rainment, clothes, covering yourself. God says, therewith, but be content. He said, but they that will be rich do what? Fall into temptation and snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of the money is the root of all evil, which some have coveted after, have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with what? Many sorrows. So is money, in the, I mean, to handle money and to do it appropriately takes a lot of spirituality, okay? So don't look down and say, well, I don't have any, I don't have nothing to worry. Yes, you do, because you'll have a tendency to be looking and wanting because you think that you need more. With food and raiment, be what? Content. So with contentment, God, he says, is uh, is, is great gain, it, godliness with contentment, to learn to be content. We've got to ask, it's a grace, 
We've got to ask God for, for, for contentment. So we look at the word content. As it's defined here, to be held, to hold, to literally held, contained within limits, hence quiet, not disturbed, having a mind at peace, easy, satisfied, so as not to repine or object or oppose. Does this bring anything to mind? How about the children when they went through the wilderness? They had food. God kept their clothes where they didn't wear out and their shoes didn't wear out. Were they satisfied? No. And there's a reason for that. And we're going to go through all these verses. And I, I'm, what I'm going to do is I've, I've listed them all here and I don't want to lose you on this. So I'm going to read a verse and then I want you to read a verse. Or I'll read a verse with you. So what you, when you look at that, then contentment, and the idea of content, a resting, a satisfaction of the mind without disquiet, acquiescence, contentment without external honor is humility. And he uses the reference even in this definition in, in Timothy 6.6, 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. I, I think we ought to just let that sink in. If we can be content... God says we have what? Great gain. The idea of that a godly person is going to be content and a godly person that is content is going to have an advantage, okay? A spiritual advantage because it's going to be what? You're, going to, you're, you're, you're allow, not allowing your flesh to dominate your thinking and not allowing it to, to define what is important in your life. So the word covetousness, or covet, covetous, is envious, jealous, desirous, greedy. And I even they put a word in here, after, somebody help me out with it, avaricious. And so what is the meaning of avaricious? Covetous, greedy of gain, immoderate desires, accumulation of property. How many of you drive around? You know, there never used to be these uh, storage facilities. I mean, there are, I mean, they even got a show on TV. What do they call that? I forgot. Storage Wars, yeah. Where they, they auction off these, uh, all these people. They can't pay for it anymore, so they, they just let it go. And these storage things, people are paying big money just to store stuff they're never going to look at. What is that? It's covetousness. I'm just not happy. You think, well, if I got more and I got to keep it and I got to store it. <laughs> Stuff you don't need. So what is covetousness? We know what covetous is and what is covetous? A strong or inordinate or irregular, disorderly or excessive, however you want to put it, Desire of obtaining and possessing some supposed good, usually in a bad sense, and applied to an inordinate desire of wealth. See that when you, and we I've seen it happen here. I've seen people look at people that got money and say, "Well, yeah, you you need to," not without saying, "You need to kind of share that, right? You got you got it, you know. You got to hand it over, right? I mean, you you can do it. That's covetousness." And you think about it, that irregular and inordinate desire of obtaining and possessing some supposed good, usually in a bad sense applied to an inordinate desire of wealth. And again, that word avarice, if I say that right. So let's go through these verses real quick. Most of this, what's on the back, and is all dealing with verses. But the idea there, the path to contentment, is that we have to have the right mind toward covetousness. Does that make sense? We've got to say, I hate covetousness. I don't like it when I see it in myself. And you, it's to the degree that you hate it that you ask God for the grace to overcome it. Because if you don't ask for God's help, you will not overcome it. You will just continue in the way that you're doing. So you've got to learn the mind of God on this. We know it is the 10th commandment. Thou shalt not covet. So I'm going to take the first verse, Mark 7, 20. 
And then you guys follow, and we'll just keep going through these verses. They actually, and I'll stop at a point and point out a couple of things. Mark 7, 20, and he said, That which cometh out of man, that defileth the man. Verse 21, For from within, out of the heart of men, come on, help me out, from within and out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, verse 22, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, and deceit. Now, now think what we're looking at. We listed covetousness in there, but is it, it was in company with what? Evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, <laughs> murders, thefts. Wickedness, deceit, it didn't just like it pointed, I mean, you, you, when you're covetous, you have, you're in bad company with some other things that are, could be a part of your life as well. I don't want that, do you? I don't want to have, I, if the devil's put those thoughts in my mind, I want to get rid of it. I, I have to bring up this illustration. Christy was cleaning out the van, the old gray van out there, and it hadn't been cleaned for a while. And, of course, there was cooties in there. And uh, cooties to the degree that it wasn't pleasant to ride in anymore. And so he's cleaning it out, and she found a Yeti, a Yeti cup with a lid and a handle. I love Yeti cups. I've, I've, I'm, I'm on my second one. I lost one. I got another one. I got a wannabe Yeti from Walmart, and that didn't really sound. Somebody bought me another one. And she says, does this belong to you? I said, no, but I like Yetis. And, I, and, I, and I, I took it home, and I had it set in there, and I thought, well, yeah, that'd be nice. I have another Yeti. I already got one Yeti, and I got a wannabe Yeti. And then I, and I thought, what do I need another Yeti for? <laughs> I don't need another Yeti. I, I can only drink out of one cup at a time. And I thought, you know what? That's just the covetousness in me. So I marched it inside. I said, this ain't my cup. This ain't my cup. I don't know whose it is. If it was my cup, it'd have all kinds of coffee stains on the inside. It kind of fit with what I was thinking about tonight. It's in us. We fill our cupboards. We fill our houses. We fill our garages. We fill our cars. Fill our minds. And it takes us away from what God, who God is. Food and raiment. What is it, Richard? Therewith be content. Say it nice and loud. Content. I'm going to be content. If I just got food and clothes, I'm going to be what? Content. All right. All right, everybody together. Luke 16, 13. No servant. Come on, help me out. No servant can serve two masters, for either you will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, riches and wealth, or the God of wealth. And you, what do you mean by despise? What do you mean if you despise the other? To scorn or disdain or to have the low opinion. So if you have a high opinion for things and stuff, <laughs> you're going to have what kind of opinion of God? Wow, oh, God, you need you're just not giving me everything I need. I mean, really, God. You make God into your little genie lamp. Verse number 14, the and the Pharisees also who were covetous heard these things and they were derided him. Well, so that gives us a little bit of an idea if we have covetousness we probably don't like the idea of somebody preaching on covetousness. Because what that means is that we've got to look at what we're collecting, what we're bringing home, what we're buying, and saying, you know, I need to take a second thought about this. Right. Got to be willing to do that. Am I right? Yeah. I gotta, if we're going to say, well, I, if I could do, take that money and use it instead of for myself, for things that I really don't need... And say, God, what would you rather me do with these things? How do you think it affects the church as a whole? 
I know for a fact. I had, when I was pastoring, I, had, I, was, I went through this idea of, of, uh, of helping people, trying to figure out where they were indebted. So we went through the Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University class, took 14 weeks. I found out people were $20,000, $25,000 in debt to credit cards. That's horrible. There was no reason. There was no reason the church was struggling the way it was. People couldn't couldn't tithe, couldn't give their their. They were unhappy, always worried about paying the bills. There's no reason for that. You know what we did with all those credit cards? They got all cut up. We brought in a big pair of scissors. We had a little little plastic tray box about this wide. Everybody brought their credit cards in. Went. I can see people's face kind of fainting. I can't live. What am I going to do now? I think some of them got them back, though. They're so easy to get. All right, together, Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Say it with me. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I, ha I had not known lust, except the law said, had said, thou shalt not, what? Covet. It's amazing, the one, one commandment he pulls out is which one? I learned I was, a, I was lack of contentment, and that though I was under the law because of my covetous behavior. Say, are you struggling? It may be a sign. Romans chapter number, let's turn there. Romans chapter number 13. I want to read more than just the verse that we have there. Romans chapter number 13. We're going to start in verse number 8. <clears throat> Good one to start on, right? Right? What's it say? Oh, no man, what? Anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Loveth worketh no ill to his neighbor, love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time that now is, is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering or wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. And look at that last, last phrase. Make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Make, make some provisions for the flesh? None. None. Oh, we've got to have all those creature comforts, Pastor. No, you don't. It's hurting you spiritually. It's a distraction because your mind is always focused on the needs of others. Self, self, self. It's all about me, me, me. It's all about me. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not who Christ is. It says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's no longer about me. You loving your neighbor as yourself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is a fulfilling of the law in verse 10. And so he says, and knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. Wake up! <laughs> I remember one of the guys that helped me when we started the church. He took seriously some of the things we're talking about. He threw away. He had tons of clothes. He threw them all in the garbage, except for, I don't know, one or two pairs. 
float. His dad went crazy. He thought he flipped out. But he took seriously. He want, his, his focus was what? I want to serve God. I want, I, want, I want to be used of God. I don't want to be distracted. You say, well, some of us, including ourselves, we got more clothes in our closet than we'll ever wear. Right? More shoes. I know I'm checking on, on, on sacred ground there, right? Shoes. I mean, right? Got to have all them shoes. Right? You got to have pink shoes and blue shoes and high shields and low shields and, and sneaker shoes. And, and I'm one to talk because I think I have five pair. But it, is a, it can be a distraction. 1 Corinthians 5.10, Yet not altogether with fornicators of this sort or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, for then needs you must go out to the world. Well, he's basically saying we separate from, from the world, but not altogether from the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or the extortioners with the idolaters, for then miss needs. So there's a need. We have to go out and give the gospel out, right? So we've got to intermingle to some degree with lost people. But notice what he says in the verse 11. He says, but now I've written unto you not to keep company if any man is called a what? A brother be a fornicator or what? Covetous or a railer, a drunkard or extortioner and such, no, not with such and one, no, not to eat. <laughs> well, you could say, Pastor, I can understand the fornicator and the idolater and the railer and the drunkard and the extortioner. But I don't know about the covetous guy. I mean, I'm going to hang out with him. It'll be all right, right? God is putting alongside persons that have struggles with never being content into the same group of those other people. Now, what, what, why am I bringing this up? Because God wants you to, what, what's he want your feelings to be toward covetousness? I what? I hate it. I hate it. I've got to do something to push back against it. You say, well, how do you push back against it? We're going to get there. Ephesians 5, 3. Read this with me. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become saints. <laughs> not once. Yeah, that's not who we are. Verse 5, for this you know that no whoremonger, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater. So it says covetous people are what? They're idolaters. Their focus is on things for themselves. Lots of things. And things that others have. That they think they need to have. You're an idolater. You wonder why your spiritual life is, is on hold? It may be because you have an idol in your home or lots of idols. Never content, never satisfied, always wanting more. I, I, I'll, I'll be happy. I'll be sad. I'll really be, I really got it if I get this or if I can do that. No, you won't. You just want more. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 3. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, Disobedient to parent, unthankful, unholy. Listen, it's all listed with all the other things. But we don't pick out the covetousness. Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without what? Covetousness. Lifestyle of wanting more. Filling every little gap you have in your drawer, your dresser, your garage. And then looking over and saying, I wish I had that car. I wish I had that house. I wish I had that piece of furniture. I wish I wish I could wear those clothes. And 
Notice what he says. For he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. There's the key. Talked to Abel about that a little bit tonight, about abiding. When Christ abides, then we're satisfied. We're content. We have peace. We have rest. When Christ isn't abiding, then we're looking for a comforter. Right? And comforter ends up being an idol and ends up being things. And it ends up not being God. It ends up being those things that we, you know, we're bombarded. How many got an Amazon app on your phone? You and me, I took mine, I took mine off. I get on it, Debbie's got to open my phone up so I can get on Amazon. Because it, I felt it creating a lust in my heart for things. I would just get on there and just start looking at things. <laughs> what am I doing? It's not like I got a lot of money to, and that I'm going to get these things for somebody else. <laughs> So what is the compath and contentment is you have to hate it. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3, And through covetousness they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you, <laughs> whose judgment now is long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Making merchandise of you. We're bombarded with it. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 14, a little farther down, having eyes full of adultery, cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart that have exercised with covetous practices. Cursed children. You know, I put these down, and I want you to, I want you to look at these and ask God, God help me. Your word, you know, and I didn't even go into the Old Testament. Now, you're going to leave today, and you may just leave the same way you came in, or you can leave and say, God, if it really does mean that godliness with contentment is great gain, then I need to get victory, and I need your help. Amen. And we're going, to, we're going to give you the path to contentment. And I've got to go kind of quickly, but I, want you to, I, want, I don't want to go so quickly that you don't get it. First of all, contentment is spiritual. To be content is spiritual, which means it's not natural. I mean, to be a content person is going to mean that you have to walk with God. You have to abide in Christ. You're not going to say, oh, I'm just going to start being content. No, it's not going to work that way. When you say, God, I don't like being evil. I don't like to be always unhappy and always wanting, always thinking i got to have better. Look at, look at Philippians with me, and you'll see this as we read through this. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, chapter 4, verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned, notice what he says there, I've learned whatsoever state I'm in to be content. It's not natural, so it has to be what? It has to be learned. That means that, you don't get it probably one day or two days. It's going to be something you're going to work on, practice, think about. Ask yourself before you go buy something or before you start looking in a covetous way or in, a, in, a, in an envious way towards somebody or something. And you're going to ask God, that I'm thinking I'm not thinking right about this. I need to learn it. Knowing. Matthew 10, verse 29, knowing your value in God's eyes. He says, aren't we much more than sparrows? One of them falls to the ground, God knows. Is it very hairs of your head are numbered? And if God takes care of the sparrow, come on, what's the rest of it? He's going to take care of you, right? And he, so we learn to trust him for our, for our daily life. Give us this day our daily bread. bread. I've learned to trust God. Now, when you're a, when you're a whiner, <laughs> I know there's no whiners in here. No groaners. No complainers. No wish I had. Wish I could. When those spirit comes up, you have to ask yourself, is that the natural man or is that the spiritual man? 
So he learned whatsoever state he was to be content. It is a spiritual work. Number two, contentment is, not ba- contentment is based on God's sovereignty. Well, what does that mean? It's not on the circumstances you find yourself in. In verse number 11, he says, I speak and I've learned that in whatsoever state I'm in, therewith be content. He's saying, basically, what? I says, I, God's got this. God's got my life. All right, I'm going to work. I'm going to pay my bills. I'm going to do what I should. But God's going to take care of me. Do we believe that? Or do we worry about that? We say, God, I, 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 you know, sometimes we just narrow down our wants. We find out that maybe we have more resources than we really realize. He says, what's never state? Basically saying, God knows what state I'm in. God's going to take care of me. Number three, contentment is being instructed to know. Look at verse number 12. I know. (laughs) What does he know? Both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So the very thing that he says there, he says that verse number three, being instructed to know. What is the, you know, what is, the, what is understanding? If, if, for instance, Zach came up to me and he's explaining to me his work, and what he does, and how he works with the kids, and how he operates the bus, and, and he'd have to keep talking to me until I, and then, then I say, I, I think I understand. I know, what you're, I, know what you're, I know what you're dealing with. What am I saying? I have his mind on what he does. What we want is God's mind on how to be content. I've been, been instructed by God. God, show me. Will God do that? Does he want that? Yes, he does. We're going to move forward. Your children are going to learn something from you. I pray to God that it is contentment. Or they're going to suffer the same issues that you suffer. And we're going to look just like the world everywhere else. People are going to look at us and we're no different. And God says, you know, they're just plain people who are just content with what they have. Modest homes, modest cars, modest living. To know is to understand and to recognize that you can have a need and that's okay. Does that make sense? You can have a need and that's okay. I mean, you don't have to get paralyzed by it. It's okay. And by the way, when you have a need, Who's to say, as it was in this scenario that we're talking about here with Paul, that God was using that to teach the Philippians to give? He is allowing them to have an, him to have a need. And he says, it's not that I want the stuff, but God wants to teach you to have fruit. So we learn by not being covetous and being content, we're able to help somebody else. How can I help them? Well, you can't help them, one, if, if your focus is on yourself. Two, if you don't have the resources because you spend it all on yourself. And if you think about it, I'm, I'm going to think about, okay, how can I cut back in order to, that I can plan to do something for somebody else? Right. We've we, we got to think that way. There ought, to be, there ought to be resources that God has set aside in your life. Listen to me. God has set apart in your life for someone else. And if you're not thinking that way, you're not in God's mind on this because that's what Paul's telling the Philippians. He says the only reason you didn't give now is because you just lacked opportunity. I think it's a big deal here, folks. We're being swallowed up by it. Number four, contentment is resting in the abiding power of God. Look at verse 13. And we always take this one, pull this one out of context for every place we want to use it. But what is is the context? I can do what? 
all things. I can, but say it with me, I can do all, what kind of all things? I can be content. I can, I can, I can be a base and I can abound all at the same time, suffer need. I can, and it's okay. <laughs> I can be hungry. It's okay. Suffer need, right? It's okay. God says it's okay. But you may not have to ask God for help with that. Because God wants to help you with that. Which is always available, direct your passions correctly. I mean, God's power is always there so that you don't lose it. And mourn and complain and whine and gripe. If and when he thoroughly, if and when, he through another may meet your need. Doesn't mean he has to do that, but more than likely he will. There's some verses I'd like for you to look up when you get home. Actually, I'd like for you to kind of read over this again. Look at the last one as we get ready to close up. Kind of contentment. Now listen to this. Verses 14 through 20. Contentment allows God an opportunity for another to be a blessing. Actually, the very first time I learned this lesson, my wife taught me this. Before I was even saved, I think. Because I was very independent. People wanted to help me, I wouldn't take help from anybody. I was too proud. I remember saying, you probably don't even remember that, do you? We were in, and she says, you're probably robbing somebody of a blessing that come and help you. Right. Now we, we, you know, we, got, we talked about the, us working together, all of us responding with different gifts from God. Maybe an opportunity, God using you to be a blessing. Look at 2 Corinthians. We, we'll, we'll look at this one as we close. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. Actually, I think I just taught on this not too long ago, so it's probably pretty fresh in our minds. 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. Actually, we're going to do this, and then we're going to do one more verse. Starting in verse number 9. Yeah, we're getting the right Corinthians here. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do that which do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as it was, that as, that as there was a readiness to do to will, so there may be a performance also of that which you have. For if there be a first a willing mind is accepted according that to a man hath, not according to that he, he hath not. For I mean not, that others men be eased and ye be burdened, but by equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want. You think about it, maybe God's given you for the very purpose of giving to somebody else. That their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. As it is written, he that hath gathered much hath nothing over, and he that hath gathered little hath no lack. So God has somehow puts this all together. And if we're going to function as the body of Christ, we've got to learn to be like Christ. And the only way we're going to be like Christ, say it with me, we're going to have to abide. Come on, we're going to have to do what? We're going to have to abide. God is going to give us grace to overcome covetousness, which is what? 
How should we think toward covetousness? We better hate it. We better spot it. We better think about it when we're getting ready to think about who? Right? It's all about me. Right? Or is it really all about you? It's all about Christ. And we've got to get a victory on this. It seems like a small thing. But is it small? It's one of the commandments. It is an issue. It's listed with all the other evils that are a part of, our, of what we despise. And we, we need to despise that just as much. If we don't, we're always going to be clamoring and clawing for something better. And God's not in it. Not shame. Let's ask God for forgiveness, first of all. And take seriously the command that he's given us. Thou shalt not what? Covet. And by the grace of God, and by abiding in Christ, we can change the way we think. It's not natural. Did I say that? It's not natural. It's supernatural. It's spiritual when we trust Christ. You let go. <laughs> right? I want to put it in my pocket and spend it the way I want. Let's close. Oh, one more verse. I did tell you that one. Proverbs chapter 30. I, I couldn't go without giving you this one, and then we're, we're done. Psalms, Proverbs chapter number 30. Maybe this is one we should read together. In verses 8 and 9. It says, remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Notice what the next verse is. Lest I be what? Full and deny thee. And say, who is the Lord? Lest I be poor and steal. And take the name of the Lord God in vain. So God gives us just exactly what we need. Nothing much over. As a matter of fact, he gives us some to give to somebody else. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. Lord, we wrestle with this. I know I do. And Father, that's, it's an ugly sin. It's a sin that deprives others of a gift. It's a, it's a sin that really undermines who you really are and what you want to be in us and through us. And Father, I pray that you, for those that heard either here in the building or online, Father, that we would approach your throne room and ask for grace to really take a serious look at the spirit of covetousness that it robs us of contentment, it robs us of great gain, because, Father, we don't see it as that bad a thing. We don't see it as evil. We don't see it as ungodly. So I pray that we'd understand it to be your will and your mind, but we need your grace and we need your abiding to change. We ask your help and your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.